Mrs. Amworth by E. F. Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Mrs. Amworth by E. F. Benson. The village of Maxley, where last summer and autumn these strange events took place, lies on a heathery and pine clad upland of Sussex. In all England, you could not find a sweeter and saner situation. Should the wind blow from the south, it comes laden with the spices of the sea. To the east, high downs protect it from the inclemencies of March, and from the west and north, the breezes which reach it travel over miles of aromatic forest and heather. The village itself is insignificant enough in point of population, but rich in amenities and beauty. Halfway down the single street, with its road and spacious areas of grass on each side, stands the little Norman church and the antique graveyard long disused. For the zest, there are a dozen small, sedate Georgian houses, red-bricked and long-windowed, each with a square of flower garden in front and an ampler strip behind, a score of shops and a couple of score of thatched cottages belonging to labourers on neighbouring estates, complete the entire cluster of its peaceful habitations. The general peace, however, is sadly broken on Saturdays and Sundays, for we lie on one of the main roads between London and Brighton, and our quiet street becomes a racecourse for flying motor-cars and bicycles. A notice just outside the village begging them to go slowly only seems to encourage them to accelerate their speed, for the road lies open and straight, and there is really no reason why they should do otherwise. By way of protest, therefore, the ladies of Maxley cover their noses and mouths with their handkerchiefs as they see a motor-car approaching, though, as the street is asphalted, they need not really take these precautions against dust. But late on Sunday night the horde of scorchers has passed, and we settle down again to five days of cheerful and leisurely seclusion. Railway strikes, which agitate the country so much, leave us undisturbed because most of the inhabitants of Maxley never leave it at all. I am the fortunate possessor of one of these small Georgian houses, and consider myself no less fortunate in having so interesting and stimulating a neighbour as Francis Urkham, who, the most confirmed of Maxleyites, has not slept away from his house, which stands just opposite to mine in the village street, for nearly two years, at which date, though still in midlife, he resigned his physiological professorship at Cambridge University and devoted himself to the study of those occult and curious phenomena which seem equally to concern the physical and the psychical sides of human nature. Indeed, his retirement was not unconnected with his passion for the strange uncharted places that lie on the confines and borders of science, the existence of which is so stoutly denied by the more materialistic minds for he advocated that all medical students should be obliged to pass some sort of examination in mesmerism, and that one of the tripost papers should be designed to test their knowledge in such subjects as appearances at time of death, haunted houses, vampirism, automatic writing, and possession. Of course they wouldn't listen to me, ran his account of the matter, for there is nothing that these seats of learning are so frightened of as knowledge and the road to knowledge lies in the study of things like these. The functions of the human frame are, broadly speaking, known. They are a country, anyhow, that has been charted and mapped out. But outside that lie huge tracts of undiscovered country, which certainly exist, and the real pioneers of knowledge are those who, at the cost of being derided as credulous and superstitious, want to push on into those misty and probably perilous places. I felt that I could be of more use by setting out without compass or knapsack into the mist than by sitting in a cage like a canary and chirping about what was known. Besides, teaching is very bad for a man who knows himself only to be a learner. You only need to be a self-conceited ass to teach. Here then, in Francis Urkham, was a delightful neighbour to one who, like myself, had an uneasy and burning curiosity about what he called the misty and perilous places. And this last spring we had a further and most welcome addition to our pleasant little community, in the person of Mrs. Amworth, widow of an Indian civil servant. Her husband had been a judge in the northwest provinces, and after his death at Peshawar, she came back to England, and after a year in London, found herself starving for the ampler air and sunshine of the country 
to take the place of the fogs and griminess of town. She had, too, a special reason for settling in Maxley, since her ancestors up till a hundred years ago had long been native to the place, and in the old churchyard now disused are many gravestones bearing her maiden name of Chaston. Big and energetic, her vigorous and genial personality speedily woke Maxley up to a higher degree of sociality than it had ever known. Most of us were bachelors or spinsters or elderly folk not much inclined to exert ourselves in the expense and effort of hospitality, and hitherto the gaiety of a small tea-party, with bridge afterwards and galoshes when it was wet, to trip home in again for a solitary dinner was about the climax of our festivities. But Mrs. Amberth showed us a more gregarious way, and set an example of luncheon parties and little dinners, which we began to follow. On other nights, when no such hospitality was on foot, a lone man like myself found it pleasant to know that a call on the telephone to Mrs. Amworth's house, not a hundred yards off, and an inquiry as to whether I might come over after dinner for a game of piquet before bedtime, would probably evoke a response of welcome. There she would be, with a comrade-like eagerness for companionship and there was a glass of port and cup of coffee and a cigarette and a game of piquet she played the piano too in a free and exuberant manner and had a charming voice and sang to her own accompaniment and as the days grew long and the light lingered late we played our game in her garden which in the course of a few months she had turned from being a nursery for slugs and snails into a glowing patch of luxuriant blossoming she was always cheery and jolly she was interested in everything and in music, in gardening, in games of all sorts, was a competent performer. Everybody, with one exception, liked her. Everybody felt her to bring with her the tonic of a sunny day. That one exception was Francis Urkham. He thought he confessed he did not like her, acknowledged that he was vastly interested in her. This always seemed strange to me, for pleasant and jovial as she was, I could see nothing in her that could call forth conjecture or intrigue surmise so healthy and unmysterious a figure did she present. But of the genuineness of Urkham's interest there could be no doubt. One could see him watching and scrutinizing her. In matter of age, she frankly volunteered the information that she was forty-five. But her briskness, her activity, her unravaged skin, her coal-black hair, made it difficult to believe that she was not adopting an unusual device and adding ten years on to her age instead of subtracting them. Often also, as our quite unsentimental friendship ripened, Mrs. Amworth would ring me up and propose her advent. If I was busy writing, I was to give her, so we definitely bargained a frank negative, and in answer I could hear her jolly laugh and her wishes for a successful evening of work. Sometimes, before her proposal arrived, Urkham would already have stepped across from his house opposite for a smoke and a chat, and he, hearing who my intending visitor was, always urged me to beg her to come. She and I should play our piquet, said he, and he would look on, if we did not object, and learn something of the game. But I doubt whether he paid much attention to it, for nothing could be clearer than that. Under that penthouse of forehead and thick eyebrows, his attention was fixed not on the cards, but on one of the players. But he seemed to enjoy an hour spent thus, and often until one particular evening in July, he would watch her with the air of a man who has some deep problem in front of him. She, enthusiastically keen about our game, seemed not to notice his scrutiny. Then came that evening, when, as I see in the light of subsequent events, began the first twitching of the veil that hid the secret horror from my eyes. I did not know it then, though I noticed that thereafter, if she rang up to propose coining round, she always asked not only if I was at leisure, but whether Mr. Urkham was with me. If so, she said, she would not spoil the chat of two old bachelors, and laughingly wished me good night. Urkham, on this occasion, had been with me for some half hour before Mrs. Amworth's appearance, and had been talking to me about the medieval beliefs concerning vampirism, one of those borderland subjects which he declared had not been sufficiently studied before it had been consigned by the medical profession to the dust heap of exploded superstitions. There he sat, grim and eager tracing with that pellucid clearness which had made him in his Cambridge days so admirable a lecturer, the history of those mysterious visitations. In them all there were the same general features. One of those ghoulish spirits took up its abode in a living man or woman, conferring supernatural powers of bat-like flight and glutting itself with nocturnal blood feasts. When its host died, it continued to dwell in the corpse, which remained undecayed. By day it rested, 
By night it left the grave and went on its awful errands. No European country in the Middle Ages seemed to have escaped them. Earlier yet, parallels were to be found in Roman and Greek and in Jewish history. It's a large order to set all that evidence aside as being moonshine, he said. Hundreds of totally independent witnesses in many ages have testified to the occurrence of these phenomena. And there's no explanation known to me which covers all the facts. And if you feel inclined to say, why then, if these are facts, do we not come across them now? There are two answers I can make you. One is that there were diseases known in the Middle Ages, such as the Black Death, which were certainly existent then and which have become extinct since. But for that reason we do not assert that such diseases never existed. Just as the Black Death visited England and decimated the population of Norfolk, so here in this very district about three hundred years ago there was certainly an outbreak of vampirism, and Maxley was the centre of it. My second answer is even more convincing for I tell you that vampirism is by no means extinct now. An outbreak of it certainly occurred in India a year or two ago. At that moment I heard my knock applied in the cheerful and peremptory manner in which Mrs. Amworth is accustomed to announce her arrival, and I went to the door to open it. Come in at once, I said, and save me from having my blood curdle. Mr. Urkham has been trying to alarm me. Instantly her vital, voluminous presence seemed to fill the room. Ah, but how lovely, she said. I delight in having my blood curdled. Go on with your ghost story, Mr. Urkham. I adore ghost stories. I saw that, as his habit was, he was intently observing her. It wasn't a ghost story exactly, said he. I was only telling our host how vampirism was not extinct yet. I was saying that there was an outbreak of it in India only a few years ago. There was more than a perceptible pause, and I saw that if Urkham was observing her, she on her side was observing him with fixed eye and parted mouth. Then her jolly laugh invaded that rather tense silence. Oh, what a shame, she said. You're not going to curdle my blood at all. Where did you pick up such a tale, Mr. Urkham? I have lived for years in India and never heard a rumor of such a thing. Some storytellers in the bazaars must have invented it. They are famous for that. I could see that Urkham was on the point of saying something further, but checked himself. Ah, very likely that it was, he said. But something had disturbed our usual peaceful sociability that night, and something had dampened Mrs. Amworth's usual high spirits. She had no gusto for her piquet, and left after a couple of games. Urkham had been silent too. Indeed, he hardly spoke again till she departed. That was unfortunate, he said. For the outbreak of, of a very mysterious disease, let us call it, took place at Peshawar, where she and her husband were, and, well, I asked. He was one of the victims of it, said he. Naturally, I had quite forgotten that when I spoke. The summer was unreasonably hot and rainless, and Maxley suffered much from drought, and also from a plague of big black night-flying gnats, the bite of which was irritating and virulent. They came sailing in of an evening, settling on one's skin so quietly that one perceived nothing till the sharp stab announced that one had been bitten. They did not bite the hands or face, but chose away the neck and throat for their feeding ground, and most of us, as the poison spread, assumed a temporary goiter. Then, about the middle of August, appeared the first of those mysterious cases of illness which our local doctor attributed to the long-continued heat coupled with the bite of these venomous insects. The patient was a boy of sixteen or seventeen, the son of Mrs. Amworth's gardener, and the symptoms were an anemic pallor and a languid prostration, accompanied by great drowsiness and an abnormal appetite. He had, too, on his throat two small punctures, where, so Dr. Ross conjectured, one of these great gnats had bitten him. But the odd thing was that there was no swelling or inflammation round the place where he had been bitten. The heat at this time had begun to abate but the cooler weather failed to restore him, and the boy, in spite of the quantity of good food which he so ravenously swallowed, wasted away to a skin-clad skeleton. I met Dr. Ross in the street one afternoon about this time, and in answer to my inquiries about his patient, he said he was afraid the boy was dying. The case he confessed completely puzzled him. Some obscure form of pernicious anemia was all he could suggest. But he wondered whether Mr. Urkham would consent to see the boy, on the chance of his being able to throw some new light on the case, and since Urkham was dining with me that night, 
I proposed to Dr. Ross to join us. He could not do this, but said he would look in later. When he came, Urkum at once consented to put his skill at the other's disposal, and together they went off at once. Being thus shorn of my sociable evening, I telephoned to Mrs. Amworth to know if I might inflict myself on her for an hour. Her answer was a welcoming affirmative, and between piquet and music the hour lengthened itself into two. She spoke of the boy who was lying so desperately and mysteriously ill, and told me that she had often been to see him, taking him nourishing and delicate food. But today, and her kind eyes moistened as she spoke, she was afraid she had paid her last visit. Knowing the antipathy between her and Urkham, I did not tell her that he had been called into consultation, and when I returned home she accompanied me to my door for the sake of a breath of night air and in order to borrow a magazine which contained an article on gardening which she wished to read. "'Ah, oh, this delicious night air,' she said, luxuriously sniffing in the coolness. "'Night air and gardening are the great tonics. There is nothing so stimulating as bare contact with rich Mother Earth. You are never so fresh as when you have been grubbing in the soil. Black hands, black nails, and boots covered with mud.' She gave her great jovial laugh. "'I'm a glutton for air and earth, she said. Positively, I look forward to death, for then I shall be buried and have the kind earth all round me. No leaden caskets for me. I have given explicit directions. But what shall I do about air? Well, I suppose one can't have everything. Uh, the magazine. A thousand thanks. I will faithfully return it. Good night. Garden and keep your windows open, and you won't have asthma. I always sleep with my windows open, said I. I went straight to my bedroom, of which one of the windows looks out over the street, and as I undressed I thought I heard voices talking outside not far away. But I paid no particular attention, put out my lights, and falling asleep plunged into the depths of a most horrible dream, distortedly suggested, no doubt, by my last words with Mrs. Amworth. I dreamed that I awoke, and found that both my bedroom windows were shut. Half suffocating, I dreamed that I sprang out of bed, and went across to open them. The blind over the first was drawn down, and pulling it up I saw, with the indescribable horror of incipient nightmare, Mrs. Amworth's face suspended close to the pane in the darkness outside, nodding and smiling at me. Pulling down the blind again to keep that terror out, I rushed to the second window on the other side of the room, and there again was Mrs. Amworth's face. Then the panic came upon me in full blast. Here I was suffocating in the airless room, and whichever window I opened, Mrs. Amworth's face would float in like those noiseless black gnats that bit before one was aware. The nightmare rose to screaming point, and with strangled yells I awoke to find my room cool and quiet, with both windows open and blinds up and a half-moon high in its course, casting an oblong of tranquil light on the floor. But even when I was awake the horror persisted, and I lay tossing and turning. I must have slept long before the nightmare seized me, for now it was nearly day, and soon in the east the drowsy eyelids of morning began to lift. I was scarcely downstairs next morning, for after the dawn I slept late, when Urkham rang up to know if he might see me immediately. He came in grim and preoccupied, and I noticed that he was pulling on a pipe that was not even filled. "'I want your help,' he said, "'and so I must tell you first of all what happened last night.' I went round with the little doctor to see his patient, and found him just alive, but scarcely more. I instantly diagnosed in my own mind what this anemia, unaccountable by any other explanation, meant. The boy is the prey of a vampire. He put his empty pipe on the breakfast table, by which I had just sat down, and folded his arms, looking at me steadily from under his overhanging brows. Now, about last night, he said. I insisted that he should be moved from his father's cottage into my house. As we were carrying him on a stretcher, whom should we meet but Mrs. Amworth? She expressed shocked surprise that we were moving him. Now, why do you think she did that? With a start of horror, as I remembered my dream that night before, I felt an idea come into my mind so preposterous and unthinkable that I instantly turned it out again. I haven't the smallest idea, I said. Then listen, while I tell you what happened later. I put out all light in the room where the boy lay and watched. One window was a little open, for I had forgotten to close it, and about midnight I heard something outside, trying apparently to push it farther open. I guessed who it was. 
Yes, it was full twenty feet from the ground, and I peeped round the corner of the blind. Just outside was the face of Mrs. Amworth, and her hand was in the frame of the window. Very softly I crept close, and then banged the window down, and I think I just caught the tip of one of her fingers. But it's impossible, I cried. How could she be floating in the air like that? And what had she come for? Don't tell me such— Once more, with closer grip, the remembrance of my nightmare seized me. I am telling you what I saw, said he. And all night long, until it was nearly day, she was fluttering outside like some terrible bat trying to gain admittance. Now put together various things I have told you. He began checking them off on his fingers. Number one, he said. There was an outbreak of disease similar to that which this boy is suffering from at Peshawar, and her husband died of it. Number two, Mrs. Amworth protested against my moving the boy to my house. Number three, she, or the demon that inhabits her body, a creature powerful and deadly, tries to gain admittance. And add this too. In medieval times, there was an epidemic of vampirism here at Maxley. The vampire, so the accounts run, was found to be Elizabeth Chaston. I see you remember Mrs. Amworth's maiden name. Finally, the boy is stronger this morning. He would certainly not have been alive if he had been visited again. And what do you make of it? There was a long silence, during which I found this incredible horror assuming the hues of reality. I have something to add, I said, which may or may not bear on it. You say that the the spectre went away shortly before dawn? Yes, I told him of my dream, and he smiled grimly. Yes, you did well to awake, he said. That warning came from your subconscious self, which never wholly slumbers and cries out to you of deadly danger. For two reasons, then, you must help me, one to save others, the second to save yourself. What do you want me to do? I asked. I want you first of all to help me in watching this boy and ensuring that she does not come near him. Eventually, I want you to help me in tracking the thing down, in exposing and destroying it. It is not human. It is an incarnate fiend. What steps we shall have to take, I don't know yet. It was now eleven in the forenoon, and presently I went across to his house for a twelve-hour vigil, while he slept, to come on duty again that night, so that for the next twenty-four hours either Urkham or myself was always in the room, where the boy, now getting stronger every hour, was lying. The day following was Saturday, and a morning of brilliant pellucid weather, and already when I went across to his house to resume my duty, the stream of motors down to Brighton had begun. Simultaneously I saw Urkham with a cheerful face, which boded good news of his patient coming out of his house, and Mrs. Amworth with a gesture of salutation to me and a basket in her hand, walking up the broad strip of grass which bordered the road. There we all met. I noticed and saw that Urkham noticed it too, that one finger on her left hand was bandaged. Good morning to you both, said she. And I hear your patient is doing well, Mr. Urkham. I have come to bring him a bowl of jelly and to sit with him for an hour. He and I are great friends. I am overjoyed at his recovery. Urkham paused a moment, as if making up his mind, then shot out a pointing finger at her. I forbid that, he said. You shall not sit with him or see him. And you know the reason as well as I do. I have never seen so horrible a change pass over a human face as that which now blanched hers to the colour of a grey mist. She put up her hand as if to shield herself from that pointing finger, which drew the sign of the cross in the air and shrank back cowering on to the road. There was a wild hoot from a horn, a grinding of brakes, a shout, too late, from a passing car, and one long scream suddenly cut short. Her body rebounded from the roadway after the first wheel had gone over it, and the second followed. It lay there, quivering and twitching, and was still. She was buried three days afterwards in the cemetery outside Maxley, in accordance with the wishes she had told me that she had devised about her internment, and the shock which her sudden and awful death had caused to the little community began by degrees to pass off. To two people only, Urkham and myself, the horror of it was mitigated from the first by the nature of the relief that her death brought. But naturally enough, we kept our own counsel and no hint of what greater horror had been thus averted was ever let slip. But oddly enough, so it seemed to me, 
he was still not satisfied about something in connection with her and would give no answer to my questions on the subject then as the days of a tranquil mellow september and the october that followed began to drop away like the leaves of the yellowing trees his his uneasiness relaxed but before the entry of november the seeming tranquillity broke into hurricane i had been dining one night at the far end of the village and about eleven o'clock was walking home again the moon was of an unusual brilliance rendering all that it shone on as distinct as in some etching I had just come opposite the house which Mrs. Amworth had occupied, where there was a board up telling that it was to let, when I heard the click of a front gate, and next moment I saw, with a sudden chill and quaking of my very spirit, that she stood there. Her profile, vividly illuminated, was turned to me, and I could not be mistaken in my identification of her. She appeared not to see me. Indeed, the shadow of the yew hedge in front of her garden enveloped me in its blackness and she went swiftly across the road and entered the gate of the house directly opposite there i lost sight of her completely my breath was coming in short pants as if i had been running and now indeed i ran with fearful backward glances along the hundred yards that separated me from my house in urkham's it was to his that my flying steps took me and next minute i was within what have you come to tell me he asked or shall i guess you can't guess said i no it's no guess she has come back and you have seen her tell me about it i gave him my story that's major pearsall's house he said come back with me there at once but what can we do i asked i have no idea that's what we have got to find out a minute later we were opposite the house when I had passed it before, it was all dark. Now lights gleamed from a couple of windows upstairs. Even as we faced it, the front door opened, and next moment Major Pearsall emerged from the gate. He saw us and stopped. "'I'm on my way to see Dr. Ross,' he said quickly. "'My wife has been taken ill, suddenly ill. She had been in bed an hour before I came upstairs, and I found her white as a ghost and utterly exhausted.' She had been to sleep, it seemed. But you will excuse me. One moment, Major, said Urquhart. Was there any mark on her throat? How did you guess that? said he. There was. One of those beastly gnats must have bitten her twice there. She was streaming with blood. And there's someone with her? asked Urquhart. Yes, I roused her maid. He went off and Urquhart turned to me. I know now what we have to do he said. Change your clothes, and I'll join you at your house. What is it? I asked. I'll tell you on our way. We're going to the cemetery. He carried a pick, a shovel, and a screwdriver when he rejoined me, and wore round his shoulders a long coil of rope. As we walked, he gave me the outlines of the ghastly hour that lay before us. What I have to tell you, he said, will seem to you now too fantastic for credence. But before dawn we shall see whether it outstrips reality. By a most fortunate happening you saw the spectre, the astral body, whatever you choose to call it, of Mrs. Amworth going on its grisly business, and therefore, beyond doubt, the vampire spirit which abode in her during life animates her again in death. That is not exceptional. Indeed, all these weeks since her death I have been expecting it. If I am right, we shall find her body undecayed and untouched by corruption. But she has been dead nearly two months, said I. If she had been dead two years, it would still be so, if the vampire has possession of her. So remember, whatever you see done, it will be done not to her, who in the natural course would now be feeding the grasses above her grave, but to a spirit of untold evil and malignancy which gives a phantom life to her body. But what shall I see done, said I? I will tell you. But know that now, at this moment, the vampire, clad in her mortal semblance, is out, dining out. But it must get back before dawn, and it will pass into the material form that lies in her grave. We must wait for that, and then, with your help, I shall dig up her body. If I am right, you will look on her as if she was in life with the full vigour of the dreadful nutriment 
she has received pulsing in her veins, and then, when dawn has come and the vampire cannot leave the lair of her body, I shall strike her with this, and he pointed to his pick, through the heart, and she, who comes to life again only with the animation the fear gives her, she and her hellish partner will be dead indeed. Then we must bury her again, delivered at last. We had come to the cemetery, and in the brightness of the moonshine there was no difficulty in identifying her grave. It lay some twenty yards from the small chapel, in the porch of which, obscured by shadow, we concealed ourselves. From that we had a clear and open sight of the grave, and now we must wait till its infernal visitor returned home. The night was warm and windless, yet even if a freezing wind had been raging, I think I should have felt nothing of it. So intense was my preoccupation as to what the night and dawn would bring. There was a bell in the turret of the chapel, and that struck the quarters of the hour, and it amazed me to find how swiftly the chimes succeeded one another. The moon had long set, but a twilight of stars shone in a clear sky, when five o'clock of the morning sounded from the turret. A few minutes more passed, and then I felt Urkham's hand softly nudging me, and looking out in the direction of his pointing finger, I saw that the form of a woman, tall and large in build, was approaching from the right. Noiselessly, with a motion more of gliding and floating than walking, she moved across the cemetery to the grave which was the centre of our observation. She moved round it as if to be certain of its identity, and for a moment stood directly facing us. In the greyness to which now my eyes had grown accustomed, I could see her face and recognise its features. She drew her hand across her mouth as if wiping it, and broke into a chuckle of such laughter as made my hair stand on end. Then she leaped onto the grave, holding her hands high above her head, and inch by inch disappeared into the earth. Urkham's hand was laid on my arm, in an injunction to keep still. But now he removed it. Come, he said. With pick and shovel and rope we went to the grave. The earth was light and sandy, and soon after six struck we had delved down to the coffin lid. With his pick he loosened the earth round it, and adjusting the rope through the handles by which it had been lowered, we tried to raise it. This was a long and laborious business, and the light had begun to herald day in the east before we had it out and lying by the side of the grave. With his screwdriver he loosened the fastenings of the lid and slid it aside, and standing there we looked in the face of Mrs. Amworth. The eyes, once closed in death, were open. The cheeks were flushed with colour. The red, full-lipped mouth seemed to smile. One blow and it is all over, he said. You need not look. Even as he spoke, he took up the pick again, and, laying the point of it on her left breast, measured his distance, and though I knew what was coming, I could not look away. He grasped the pick in both hands, raised it an inch or two for the taking of his aim, and then with a full force brought it down on her breast. A fountain of blood, though she had been dead so long, spouted high in the air, falling with the thud of a heavy splash over the shroud and simultaneously from those red lips came one long appalling cry, swelling up like some hooting siren, and dying away again. With that, instantaneous as a lightning flash, came the touch of corruption on her face. The colour of it faded to ash, the plump cheeks fell in, the mouth dropped. Thank God that's over, said he, and without pause slipped the coffin lid back into its place. Day was coming fast now, and working like men possessed, we lowered the coffin into its place again, and shoveled the earth over it. The birds were busy with their earliest pipings as we went back to Maxley. End of Mrs. Amworth by E. F. Benson Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama